Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, September 9th, 2014. We're talking about education today and how private schools, low-cost private schools, are educating the poor all over the world. We talked about this with Pauline Dixon earlier this year. But now we're talking to James Tooley, whose work in this area is just extraordinary. I could spend all my time just listing for you the awards he's won, the recognition he has received. He is a professor of education policy at the University of Newcastle, where he directs the E.G. West Center. The book of his we're going to talk about today is The Beautiful Tree, a personal journey into how the world's poorest people are educating themselves. Stay tuned after my conversation with James Tooley for an important note about the future of this show. So don't go away after my chat. But James Tooley, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to talk to you, Tom. You know, after I had Pauline Dixon, also of the E.G. West Center, as a guest earlier this year, I got a bunch of emails saying, well, now you obviously have to have James Tooley on to continue this conversation. What she told us in that appearance was quite surprising. And I'm mm. sure what you're, I'm sure you get the same response when you go around telling people about a phenomenon, namely low-cost private schools in the developing world, that n- no one would remotely have any way of knowing about. It's, it's still extraordinary to me. I, I've been talking about this actually for nearly 14 years now. 14 years ago, I first came across this phenomenon. I've been talking about it almost since the day I found, uh, found it. And I still get people who are surprised by it, even in their own countries. So I, I'm in India recently. I tell people still there they don't know about it and certainly when i go to new countries to to do further work i've been recently in uh, liberia south sudan and sierra leone countries going through a terrible time at the moment but the same phenomenon exists but even there you talk to people in government or ngos and non-government organizations or you know middle class people and they don't know about it so it is extraordinary the the, the poor are doing something with themselves all over the world and yet somehow People refuse to accept that 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 that, that, they're, that they are doing it. And you, in the book, the beautiful tree, you give us an overview of what's going on in a number of countries, and that is interesting too. That we're not dealing with an odd cultural attribute of one particular people in one part of the world. This phenomenon mm-hmm. seems to replicate itself among cultures that have not interacted with each other. It seems to be going on all over the place. Yeah, that, that, that is an extraordinary finding, isn't it? I mean, you, you put it very, very well. That, well I, I first came across this phenomenon, actually, it was in, uh, in Hyderabad, in, in India. And that's exactly what happened. People sort of took words out of your mouth, said, oh, it's just a cultural phenomenon ha- ha- happening amongst the Muslims in the old city of Hyderabad. Yeah, we know about it, but um, you know, it's not happening anywhere else. And then I got the research money from the John Templeton Foundation. They trusted that I was talking about something sensible. We went to Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Zimbabwe, India, several parts of India, and even rural China. The same thing was happening in each of these places. And I, the same response to inadequate government schooling or no government schooling, poor people were setting up their own schools, charging roughly the sim- same amount in each of these places, uh, you know, relative to the, to the income of, of the country. And... Um, Performing these, these schools were performing better than the alternatives, and it, it was even the similarities were even to the extent of the proportion of children in private schools in each of these places. In in urban areas, think of the the, the great majority, you know, sixty five to seventy five percent of children in these low cost private schools in urban areas, and perhaps a quarter to a third in rural areas. The same picture. You know, you can drop me in any country, almost will find the same thing going on. I think Quite one, remarkable. Well, one of the reasons it must be hard for some people to imagine is that we know that the daily income of these people is so low that the amount of money they could possibly have 
that we could conceivably think of as disposable income would be vanishingly small to nothing. How can a private school sustain itself under those conditions? Yeah, but but you, I mean, poverty is terrible, of course. But don't never overdo it because remember the the cost of living in these countries is incredibly low as well, um, and, and so the the amount of money people have is enough. It turns out is it's not an a priori argument. It's not sort of us sitting here saying what can people afford. It turns out that even those on the poverty line, and we've done a lot of work in our recent studies in Sierra Leone, Liberia, in South Sudan, and Nigeria, looking at the poverty line, you know, that, that, uh, res- that respected, as it were, pov- internationally respected poverty line of $1.25 per, per day, that poverty line, even on that, families can afford private school um, for their children. The fees are incredibly low, which means, now critics will say this, they'll jump at it straight away, they'll say, ah, that means the teachers are paid very little, um, and, and therefore you're exploiting the, um, the, the potential teachers. Well, it's true, the teachers are paid considerably less than teachers in the government schools. Maybe a third, some places even, even a smaller fraction than that. But there's no short and typically there are no shortage of teachers wanting that work for that that price so it suggests there's a market value there and that these schools are not exploiting their staff they're actually providing employment for 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 local teachers um in in those communities and, and doing a valuable job there so yes they are very low cost and typically we're talking in african cases maybe 5 to 10 dollars us dollars per month equivalent um, you know, that's the sort of figure we're looking at, maybe 3 to $7, $8 per month equivalent in, in India. But it, it can be provided. It's, it's, it's a fact it's there. Um, and you, you know, when you look through the, 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 the accounts of these schools, you can see, oh, yes, I see how you do it. I see how it's affordable. Um, we see what you're doing. Now, Americans and I suppose uh, British people as well have certain expectations when they hear the word school, they... They can picture the schoolhouse. They know yeah. that it goes from about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., that there yeah. are certain subjects that are taught. So I suppose that what we're dealing with in many of these cases is something rather different. I mean, what kind of subject uh, matter is discussed? How long are they in the schools? I bet there's no one answer to this question, of course, given the diversity no, but, of places. But, yeah, but, but I, I, again, I would, I, would, I would challenge you in what you just said. Um, these are recognizably schools. They're recognizably a school building which starts, you know, whether it's 8.30, 8 to 9, whatever it is, and carries on until 3 to 4 in the afternoon. It has timetabled lessons. It has the, 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 the subjects are very familiar, you know, to a British or an American audience, mathematics, English, science, social science, and, of course, uh, local languages. Um, so, so, and the building now, they vary in quality, of course, immensely, as you'd expect. But nonetheless, there is a recognizable building on a recognizable plot of land um, doing a recognizable curriculum. So this is not something that, you know, American... Um, listeners, they'll think, oh, I won't, won't even be able to spot this. No, you'll spot it, you'll see it, you'll recognize it um, very much as a school as you know it. I wanted to give you a chance to answer that question because I could imagine that one criticism would be maybe you're defining school so liberally that a small co-op of parents qualifies as a school. I wanted to make yeah. clear that this actually would be a school environment that would not be altogether remote from the experience of many people listening to this program. Yeah, it's very important to stress that. And in our research, you know, whenever we publish research in you know, academic journals, or whatever, we specify this that we are not describing what other people might call non-formal after-school, you know, alternative education. No, no, we're describing regular schools, and they are they are everywhere. Maybe three hundred thousand of these low-cost private schools in India alone. Maybe a hundred thousand in Anglophone West Africa. You know, it's an amazing phenomenon, but very much schools as you know them. Now, what's going on in this regard in China? It's surprising that there would be a chapter on China. I could understand some countries aren't engaged in enough, aren't engaged in formal education simply because they maybe they lack the infrastructure to do it and the parents have to fend for themselves. But I would think with a regime like China, 
education serves a very important ideological service. So what's yes. going on there? How can they allow any sort of competition to that? Very interesting. And, and China, as you say, is a chapter in the beautiful tree. And I, I've done work since then um, in China. And, and there are two sorts of low-cost private school in China. And they're both very much, as you say, under the radar, a, a bit like the sort of independent churches you might get there. That's mm. a similar sort of phenomenon, tolerated by the government, but, but perhaps... You know, one day there might be some some more pressure on them, as there is in a lot of countries. But the two types, one is the one I describe in The Beautiful Tree. These are in the remote mountains, the foothills of the Himalayas. We were in Gansu province, which is one of the poorest provinces in northwest China. But there, there is a public school provided. It's it's not terrible. I mean, in India or in the African countries, the public schools are terrible. But this school is not terrible. The teachers are just about turning up. There, it's okay, but it's too far away. The children might live two, three, four hours walk away in further mountains. They're not going to be able to go to that school every day. They can't afford to board. They don't, or their parents need them at home. So, therefore, these entrepreneurs set up private schools in their own villages. So, government schools are there. Public schools are there but they're too far away. But the second type, and this is very interesting, is in the city, um, so big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and so on, and that's where the migrant workers, the um, floating population, as the Chinese colorfully call them, the migrant workers from the rural areas come to the cities. Now, in China, they're not really legal citizens of the cities. They're not really supposed to be there. Um, so they come in, and that they can't really access public schools, or if they do, are able to, they're discriminated against. And in any case, they may have more than one child, so some of the children won't even be, as it were, legal children. So again, entrepreneurs set up low-cost private schools in the poorer parts of the major cities, catering for the migrant population. So, very interesting. Again, very much the government is controlling these schools still with the curriculum and, and so on, so they still will... Will, will transfer the sort of ideological message required. But nonetheless, uh, there are entrepreneurs working there. Very fascinating. Well, one of the questions I asked Pauline Dixon mm. involved the quality of the education, and it turns out that there has actually been work done whereby you, can, you have a benchmark of comparison because you can compare these schools, in some cases, to government-run schools where the students are of the same demographic. You've got as close... Uh, controlled experiment as you could ask for, and these low-cost private schools seem to come out quite well. Yes. I mean, we've, we've done quite a lot of studies ourselves. I think the, in the beautiful tree, I report the studies from Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, um, and two or three parts of India and China. Um, and, and other people have done... But we've now done studies from Sierra Leone, Liberia, South Sudan as well, and uh, there are many other people, as it were, coming in on this, giving evidence, and a recent review from the British government, the De 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 Department of International Development, DFID, uh, came and said this was one of the most robust findings. Private schools, especially these low-cost private schools, outperform government schools. It's a robust finding across many countries and many studies, um, and in, in the vast majority of the, the subjects there. So they, and, and as you say, we've, we've tested many, many children. You're able to control for the background variables. So this is not just looking at the, the raw test scores as it were and saying, ah, oh, the kids in the private schools are doing better. No, this is controlling for family background, you know, mother's education, income in the family, proxies for wealth, and, and, and so on. So these private schools are doing better. Now, when you go to government schools in these places, it really is not much of a surprise, you know. I mean, some, some few government schools might be okay, but in most of them, the teachers are not turning up on time. They're not teaching when they should be. They're getting the kids to do stuff for them or leaving them to play. Uh, it's, so it's not really such a surprise in schools where the teachers are on task. Um, the kids will be doing better. But they are doing better, and it's a wonderful, wonderful... Uh, one can celebrate this private entrepreneurship at the grassroots, doing something for themselves, and doing it better than the government alternative, which has got, amongst other things, billions of dollars of aid thrown at it in order to improve it's not working. 
Now, this is a wonderful story, but I wonder if yeah. you've ever had any critics who have said, this is a nice story you're telling, but I think James Tooley has an ideological agenda here. His main audience is not, or his main subject matter really is not the developing world, it's the Western world. He probably wants to cut education funding in the Western world, and he's using this as one of his arguments to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, let's let's be uh, <laughs> well, let's be honest. One has a lot of critics, and a lot of critics will throw whatever they can at you, including these sort of ad hominem attacks and ideological attacks and so on. But uh, you know, I, I think when it comes across in the beautiful tree, I didn't, you know, I didn't go out there to find this. I was. Yeah, I grew up as a, a young man who was very much against this sort of thing. I, my, my, my doctoral thesis was supposed to be against the privatization of education. I was really reading, studying philosophical arguments, and then seeing this evidence has led me to the position where I am now. So I didn't come ideologically presupposed to find this, but you know the evidence when you see it is pretty overwhelming. But as for coming back to America, coming back to the UK. As it happens, I've spent most of my time over the last 10 years or so um, overseas, you know, away from the developed West. But I am interested in America. I am in, interested in Britain. I'm just about to, uh, a pub paper's just coming out in is it Social Philosophy and Policy, um, like a journal there, where I actually say, could this be relevant to America too? And it's based on the, the realization, of course, you've got charter schools, you've got various initiatives which are giving choice and alternatives to poor parents. But these charter schools have huge waiting lists. Um, I, I, I remember reading about these waiting lists and thinking, okay, those parents, now they're being frustrated. Maybe they would like some low-cost alternative. Could you create a low-cost private school alternative in America? that could attract those parents. I'm interested in that, but it's certainly not the basis of my work. It's certainly not what inspires my work, but nonetheless, it could be an interesting sort of a, 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 a result of what I'm talking about. Well, given the nature of my audience, I can't help asking about some other work you've done where you've evaluated some of the common claims about the need for government provision of education, and you've responded to them. Mm. So would you mind walking us through some of these? Because this is, I have an audience that is very hardcore libertarian. It's a very big audience, and it's very hardcore libertarian. And I think this is one of the issues, when they're talking to their friends, they run into the greatest objections. They, they run into the most brick walls. They say, look, I, yeah. I understand we don't want price controls on milk. You know, we get that. But we do need government provision of schools, because otherwise everyone would be illiterate and worshipping Thor. Yeah. So, so the, the 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 answer to that is uh, it's not true. Um, and uh, actually, I, I'm 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 not. I, I can't talk about the American evidence from memory. I can tell you the evidence from Britain from memory, and the the evidence from America is somewhat similar. Okay. But before the state got involved in England and and Wales in 1870 there was almost universal provision. Universal provision from the private sector, but that included churches, it included philanthropists, and it included these much uh, maligned, what were called dame schools, but they were, they were in effect, low-cost private schools. So this movement was there in England and Wales before the government got involved. Similar evidence is from the American states as well. Um, and the government got involved and eventually crowded out the system. So first of the first, the first argument is, um, no, it's not true that without the state, you can't have any educational opportunities. In fact, educating your children, it is natural to parents, including poor parents, is feeding and clothing them. As soon as they got any chance of, um, of social mobility, they want their children educated. The vast majority do only a small minority, a tiny minority, maybe 5% it was in the England and Wales in the 19th century, um, were, were not getting their children educated. But the second argument is, okay, people then talk about equality or equity or social justice. These are taboo words perhaps for your audience, but nonetheless, this is, this is the argument they'll, they'll get. 
um, thrown their way? What about social justice? What about the poor? As to why my work is so valuable for this argument, because first of all, you say, well, social justice is not served by public education. Anywhere in the country we're working in, and I bet a lot of people feel the same way about poor parts of America, too, Social justice is not being served by the public sector. The middle classes, the richer, the elite, they can always get the better public schools. They, they, have, they, they, they have school choice through house prices. Certainly that's the case in England. And obviously they can afford something else. But what this work is saying is the poor can afford private schools which cater to their needs are responsive. And the social justice argument about the poorest of the poor well, you can have targeted assistance for those for those families, for those students, maybe through some sort of targeted vouchers, scholarships, but also allowing entrepreneurship to flourish because entrepreneurship in a competitive market can bring down prices. And this is what we're seeing in some of our work in West Africa in particular, where we're working with entrepreneurs and seeing how actually you can bring down the price even more to make them even more affordable for the poor. So I think there's a couple of arguments. Historically, it certainly wasn't true that the state was needed to provide educational opportunities, even in Britain and America. And certainly the social justice argument is not met. Social justice is not met by public education um, but it can be met through private schools which are responsive to the needs of the poor, plus some targeted philanthropy. Uh, James, before I let you go, you are director of the E.G. West Center at Newcastle mm-hmm. University, and mm-hmm. this question that I just asked you, I think, is a nice segue into discussing, just for a minute, if you would, the work of E.G. West, who, of course, mm-hmm. did work on the history of education in, in its pre-state and post-state provision. Exactly. And, that, and of course, it was his work I was citing just now when I spoke about the history of the education system, as it were, the private system in, in Victorian England uh, and Wales. And, and he's also got evidence from New York and Massachusetts, as well as New South Wales in, in Australia. Uh, E.G. E. West, Professor Edwin George West, um, he, he um, finished his career as professor at Carleton University in, in, in Ottawa. But he began his career um, in this building where I'm speaking to you from now, in Newcastle. He, it was here. He was a lecturer in economics. He wrote his masterpiece, really, in 1965, Education and the State, which was published by the Institute of Economic Affairs here. It's been republished by Liberty Fund in America. And uh, he, he really... Put, put, a cat, put the cat amongst the pigeons of the statists who came up with those sort of arguments. Oh, you need government to bring education. And he was the major influence on my life. I, I hinted earlier when I started my PhD, I wanted to be writing against the privatization initiatives in education um, or the so-called privatization there. I read E.G. West's Education and the State. It changed my life because... It, was, it made me think the status quo of public education, we take it for granted so much and we assume any modification to it has to be justified. What Eddie West said is, says is the status quo of state education has only been there a hundred years. It's only been there for a while and it was imposed upon a free market of educational provision it needs to be justified. It, you know, it has to be justifying itself, not us trying to move away from it. That was a key insight that um, Eddie West's work brought to me. Well, the book we've been talking about is The Beautiful Tree, a personal journey into how the world's poorest people are educating themselves. James, if people want to follow your work, should they go to the E.G. West Center online? Where should I send them? Yeah, go, go, go to the E.G. West Center online. Uh, um, and, and have a look there. I, I do tweet uh, James underscore Tooley. Um, but uh, yeah, come and visit us online. Email me, james.tooley at ncl.ac.uk. I'm really interested in hearing people who are interested in this work. It's a, it's a terrific journey. I've been on. There's lots more to do. Lots more to do. Well, I want to make sure listeners know we're talking about the British spelling of center here, E.G. West Center, <laughs> C-E-N-T-R-E dot com. Yes. Well, thanks so much for your time, James Tooley, a fascinating conversation. 
been a pleasure talking to you, Tom. Thanks for phoning. All right, everybody, let's spend a few minutes talking about the show. The deal more or less was in the past year that I would fill in for Peter Schiff on his radio show, which he's now discontinued, in exchange for getting a free producer for my show. And I can't do the show without a producer. With everything I have going on, there's no way I can line up guests and do the correspondence and get the books and do all that. I, there's just no way I can do it. So I rely on a producer. I do the editing of the show and the audio. I mean, I put the show together. But I do need somebody for all the logistical stuff. Well, now that Peter's not doing the show anymore, there goes my free producer. So that is an expense coming out of pocket, but it is an absolutely indispensable one. So I want to make clear my gratitude to those of you who have been who have become supporting listeners of the show at supportinglisteners.com and those of you who have been using the Amazon widget at tomwoodsradio.com or tomwoods.com to make your Amazon purchases. That really does help me shoulder expenses like this. But if you were inclined to do either of these things and hadn't quite gotten around to it yet, well, now might be a pretty good time to think about doing that. Another thing is, over the next four to six weeks, I'm redesigning my personal site, tomwoods.com, from top to bottom. And I'm going to bring the show home to my site. TomWoodsRadio.com will always work as a redirect to my site, so that's not an issue. If you get the show through iTunes or Stitcher or any of these podcatchers, you're not going to be affected in any way. But I don't like the idea that I've got two different sites, basically. I, I want everything to be at TomWoods.com. TomWoods.com will be the, the central site for the show. When you go to TomWoods.com, you'll see the Tom Woods Show logo on it. That's the central thing that I'm doing these days. So that's going to be the central focus of my site. And then, of course, all my spin-off projects will be linked and talked about there as well. But the central focus of TomWoods.com will be the show. So that's going to be coming in the next four to six weeks. There's a lot of work to do. You've got to redesign the site. I'm pulling all the shows off the current server and onto another one. And on the new site, unlike on the current site, we'll have a page for each episode. Right now, if you click on a link, it just takes you to our archive and it starts playing your show, but there are no show notes. There's no easy way to download the episode right from there. This is all going to change in the next four to six weeks. I'm going to be doing a whole lot of work to make this a much, much more user-friendly experience for all you guys. Now, also, starting immediately, there isn't going to be a live stream anymore. It wasn't really a live stream anyway. Uh, but that's okay. I don't really want that. The, the, the stream was originated back when I thought this was going to be a live show. And then I decided early on, you know, I, I don't think I really want it to be a live show. So the fact that we stream the show every day is kind of an artifact of the original intention of having it be a live show. But it's not a live show. And I don't know of any other podcast who does a stream like that. So we're not doing the stream anymore. So I have to change my graphic on my... Uh, my graphic on iTunes, which says Monday through Friday, noon Eastern. Uh, not so. It's Monday through Friday, anytime you feel like listening to the episode. So we will put the episodes up there. We'll still have the archive. The daily episode will show up there at some point during the day, but it won't be streaming. Now, I don't think a whole lot of people use the stream. Maybe just a 1,000 people used the stream, but that's still a pretty good number, considering that it's vastly more convenient to download it, and we seem to have quite a few downloads, and I appreciate that. Thanks for subscribing on iTunes and Stitcher. So that's what's going on. The live stream ain't no more, but it makes no sense. It wasn't live. It was a stream, but it wasn't live. So that's gone. you got to just listen. You can go there and press play, and it'll be kind of like a stream. It just it won't be automatically running from noon to roughly 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time every day. So... Lots more announcements coming in the next few days. I've got, I'm have got i launching a couple of big things that I'm going to let you guys know about uh, in the coming days. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for supporting the show. We're almost at a year of doing this show, and it's been a lot of fun and very educational for me, and I hope you guys feel the same way. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.